Hi guys, welcome. It is Wednesday, March 25th, and today we are reading Liddy, chapter 15, which starts on page 117 in your book. I'll be reading that one out loud. While we are reading, we are going to be doing your journal pages. We're going to be taking notes on the setting, the characters, the plot, answering the comprehension questions on the right hand side, and also discussing the vocab on the back. Okay, now keep in mind that you can press pause at any time to get caught up on your notes. I'm just going to read from beginning to end. Okay, and I will stop to make clarification of some difficult parts if I feel that there are any that you need clarification on. But always remember you can go on Edsby and message me if you have any questions. Okay, let's get started. Got to get some coffee first. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Rachel. So she told no one about the money. She wanted to tell Diana. Diana, she knew, would rejoice with her. But she decided to wait. If you guys don't remember the money, remember from before spring break when Ezekiel sent back the money he had loaned from her. Uh, remember he was a runaway slave and she gave him all the, the calf money she had and he ran away and he actually paid it back to her. So she has a lot of money right now. She was so close now to having the money she needed and when she did she would surprise Diana by signing the petition. Then, not more than a week after Luke had brought the money, she had a second visitor who turned her life upside down. Uh oh, dun dun dun, that's foreshadowing. She had left the bedroom door open, trying to encourage a faint breeze through the stuffy room while she washed out her stockings and underwear in the basin. A basin is um, a sink, okay, or a bowl because they don't have indoor plumbing, or not in her room. She has a bowl, basically. All right. Let's see where did I leave off. Okay. Suddenly, she was aware of Tim standing in the doorway. She looked up from her washing. There's a visitor for you in the parlor. Ma says to tell you, a gentleman. Charlie, she was sure it must be he, all grown up to a gentleman, for who else would come to see her? She could hardly count Luke Stevens. She squeezed the water from her laundry and hastily wiped her hands upon her apron as she ran down the stairs. But it wasn't Charlie, waiting in the corner of the dining room that Mrs. Bedlow called a parlor. Nor was it Luke. She wondered why Tim had called him a gentleman at all. At first, she was sure he was a stranger. He seemed so out of place. In the room of neatly dressed, chattering factory girls, this short man, very thin, with a weathered face and the homespun clothes of a hills farmer. Don't you know your uncle, eh? The man asked at the same moment. She recognized him for Judah, Aunt Clarissa's husband, whom she hadn't seen since she was a small thing. Made it in two days, he boasted, slept right in the wagon. She tried to smile, but her heart was beating like a churning blade against her breast. What could have brought him here? Anything to do with Clarissa had always spelled trouble. What's the matter? She spoke as quietly as she could, feeling every eye in the crowded parlor turn their way. Why have you come? He sobered at once. Here, when it says sobered, it means he gets real serious. He was light and cheerful before, but now sobered like, oh, I got something to tell you. Now remember the last letter that she got from her mother, because this is the home that the mother lives in, baby Agnes had died. So sobering right now means, uh-oh, what else bad has happened? He sobered at once, as though remembering a solemn duty. Your Aunt Clarissa thought you'd need to be told. Told what? A chill went through her. Your ma's never been stout, you know. The fever? Did she catch the fever? He glanced around at the girls seated in the room who were pretending not to listen, but whose ears stood up, alert as wild creatures in a meadow. He lowered his voice, tapping his head. Stout up here, eh? Liddy stared at him. What had they done to her mother? Judah dropped his eyes, uncomfortable under her stare. So we've been obliged. What have you done to my mother? She whispered fiercely. We've been obliged to remand her to Brattleboro, to the asylum down there. 
You guys know what that means. They put her in a crazy house. But that's for the crazy folk. Judah put on a face of hound dog sorrow and sighed deeply. It were just too much care for poor Clarissa, delicate as she be. Why didn't you ask me? I've been responsible for her before. I can do it. He cocked his head. You weren't there, eh? Where's Rachel? What have you done with the baby? Why? He said, relieved to have gotten off the subject of her mother. Why, she's just fine. Right out front in the wagon. I brung her to you. Liddy brushed past him out the door. The farm wagon stood outside, the patient oxen, oblivious to how comically out of place they looked on a city street, chewed their cuds contentedly. For all the stuffiness upstairs, it was damp and chilly down on the street, and Rachel sat shivering on the bench of the wagon, wrapped in a worn shawl that Liddy recognized as her mother's. She climbed up on the wagon step and lifted the child down. Rachel was too light, boneless as a rag doll. As Liddy went up the steps of the boarding house, she could feel tiny burden trembling through the shawl. It's all right, Rachie. It's me, Liddy, she said, hoping the child could remember her. She carried Rachel inside to where Judah stood still, still stood, nervously pinching the rim of his sweat-stained hat. It's your sister, Rachie, Judah boomed out, his voice fake with hearty cheer. A gasp went up from the girls in the parlor. Like Aunt Clarice told you, eh? We brung you to Liddy. Have you got her things? In answer, he went out to the wagon and brought back a sack with a small lump at the bottom. What about my mother's things? She asked coldly, no longer caring about the audience and what they heard. There weren't hardly nothing, he said. She let it go. He was nearly right. Well, he said, looking from one sister to the other, I'll be off, then, eh? I'm coming to fetch our mother soon as I can. As soon as I pay off the debt, I'll take her back home and care for her myself. He turned at the door, the hat brim rolled tight and squeezed into his big hands. Back where? Home, she repeated, to the farm. Ah, uh, we be sailing it. Did you hear what he said? They're going to sell their farm. It's not even their farm. It's mother's farm, but uncle and aunt are going to sell the farm. We be selling it, he said. We got to have the money for, for battle, Brattleboro. No! Her voice was so sharp that the room full of girls stopped everything they were doing to stare. Even little Rachel twisted in her arms to look at her with alarm. She went close to Judah and lowered her voice again to a fierce whisper. No one can sell that land except my father. He gave permission. How? She was seized with the wild hope. Her father? They had heard from him? When? Before he left. He had it wrote out and put his mark to it. In case, eh? She wanted to scream at him. But how could she? She had already frightened Rachel. You've got no right, she said between her teeth. We got no choice, the man said stubbornly. We'd be responsible, and he was gone. Once more, Liddy was aware of the other girls in the room who were watching her open mouth and gaping at the dirty little bundle in her arms. She buried her face in the shawl. Come on, Rachie, she said as much to them as to the child. We gotta go get Mrs. Bed meet Mrs. Bedlow. She straightened up tall and made her way through the chairs and knees to the kitchen. Mrs. Bedlow? The housekeeper was sitting in the kitchen locker, peeling potatoes for tomorrow's hash. What in heaven's name? At the housekeeper's sharp question, Rachel's little head came up from the depths of the shawl like a turtle from a shell. It's Rachel, Mrs. Bedlow. Liddy made her voice as gentle as she could. My sister, Rachel. She could read the warning in Mrs. Bedlow's eyes. No men, no children, except for the keeper's own, in a corporation house. But surely the woman would not have the heart. I'm begging a bath for her. She's had a long, rough journey in an ox cart, and she's chilled right through. Eh, Rachie? Rachel stiffened in her arms, but Mrs. Bedlow dropped her paring knife into the bowl of peeled potatoes, wiped her hands on her apron, and put a kettle on to boil. It was only after they had both seen Rachel safely sleep in Liddy's bed that Mrs. Bedlow said the words that Liddy knew were on her mind. It won't do, you know. She can't stay here. I'll get her a job. She can dorf. Doff. You know she's not old enough or strong enough to be a doffer. Just till I can straighten things out, Liddy pleaded. Please let her stay. I'll get it all set in just a few days, eh? Mrs. Bedlow sighed and made her shake her head and made to shake her head. I'll pay, of course, full board, 
and you see how small that she is. You know she won't eat a full share. Mrs. Bedlow sat down and picked up her paring knife. Liddy held her breath. A week. Even then. It wouldn't be more than a fortnight. I give you my vow. I just got to write my brother. Mrs. Bedlow looked doubtful, but she didn't say no. She just sighed and started to peel again. The long coil so thin it was almost transparent. I'm obliged to you, Mrs. Bedlow. I got nowhere to turn. Else. She mustn't go outdoors. We can't have her seen about the premises. No, no, I swear, I'll keep her in my room. The other girls won't even know. Mrs. Bedlow looked at Liddy Riley. They already know, and there's no guarantee they'll keep their peace. I'll beg them. No need to coop her up more than necessary. She can come down with me during the day. I'll have Tim help her with her letters and numbers in the afternoon. She ought to be in school herself. She will be, Mrs. Bedlow, she will be. Soon as I can get things worked out, I swear upon my life. You need to watch your language, my girl. Set an example for the little one. I thank you, Mrs. Bedlow. You'll not be sorry, I promise. She wrote Charlie that night after curfew in the flickering light of the forbidden stub of candle. Dear Brother Charles, I hope you are well. I'm sorry to trouble you with sad news, but Uncle Judah come tonight to Lowell and Brum Rachel to me. They have put our mother to the asylum at Brattleboro. Now they are thinking to sell the farm. You must go and stop them. You are the man of the family. Judah won't pay me no mind. They got to listen to you. I got more than $100 to the debt. Do not let them sell, Charlie. I beg you. I do not know what to do with Rachel. Children are not allowed in the corporation house. If I can, I will take her home. But I got to have a home to go to. It is up to you, Charlie. Please, I beg you to stop Uncle Judah, your loving sister, Liddy Worthen. She could hardly keep her mind on her work. What was the use of it all anyway if the farm was gone? But it couldn't be, not after all of her sweating and saving. And what was she to do with Rachel? The child hadn't spoken a word since her arrival. She hadn't even cried. She seemed more dead than alive. And precious time must be spent finding her a place to stay and precious money put out for her keep, more if she was to go to school. Why couldn't the child work in the spinning room? There were Irish children down there who looked no older than seven or eight. They were earning their own way. Hadn't Liddy herself been working hard since she was no more than a tadpole? And doffing wasn't as hard as farm work. Why, those children hardly worked 15 minutes out of the hour, just taking off the full spools and replacing them with empty ones. Then they just sat in the corner and played or chatted. Sometimes from the window on a clear day, Liddy had seen them running about the mill yard playing tag or marbles. It was an easy life compared to the farm, and still Rachel would be out of mischief and earning her own way as if she hadn't had trouble enough. Bridget was crying again. Liddy glanced over at the loom. Everything seemed in order, but the Irish girl was standing there, staring at the shuddering machine with tears running down her cheeks. Liddy quickly checked her own looms before walking over and saying in the girl's ear, What's the matter with you, eh? Bridget looked around startled. She bit her lip and shook her head. Liddy shrugged. It was just as well if the girl learned to bear her own troubles. Mr. Marsden stopped Liddy at the stairs on the way to breakfast. Her heart nodded. How could he have heard about Rachel already? Had one of the other girls tattled so soon? They were jealous of her, Liddy knew. She was the best operator on the floor. But it was not about Rachel that Mr. Marsden wished to speak. It was about the wretched Irish girl. You must tell her, he said, that she must get her speed up. I can't keep her on even as a spare hand unless she can maintain a proper pace. Why didn't he tell her himself? He was the overseer. Bridget did not belong to her. She hadn't asked for a spare hand, hadn't wanted one, and now he was trying to shove the responsibility off on her? She spoke to Bridget after the break. He says you'll have to speed up or he can't keep you on. The girl's eyes widened in fear, reminding Liddy, oh, cuss it, of Rachel's silent face as the child sat crouched within herself in the corner of Mrs. Bedlow's kitchen. Oh, tarnation, she hollered in Bridget's ear. I'll help you. We'll do the five looms together for a few days, just till you get on better, eh? The girl smiled faintly, still frightened. And keep your mind on your blooming work, you hear? We can't have you catching your hair or being hit in the head by a flying shuttle because you're being stoop, because your mind is someplace else. Fresh tears started in the girl's eyes as she bit her lip again and nodded. Liddy could see Diana smiling approval. Good thing she couldn't hear me, Liddy thought wryly. 
She wouldn't be thinking I was so kindly then. By the seven o'clock bell, Bridgie was looking a little less distraught, and Mr. Marsden came past to pat both girls proudly. Liddy sighed and hardly bothered to dodge him. She had gotten off the fewest pieces in one day since she had had four looms, and she still had to go home to the burden of silent little Rachel. Well, it won't do, said Mrs. Bedlow. She won't talk to either Tim or me, not a word. Just sits trembling in the corner like a frozen mouse. Did she manage to eat anything? Did she manage to eat? She eats like she hasn't had food in a month of Sundays. I fed her with Tim. She out ate him, and he is a grown boy but never a word through it all. Just shovels it in like there'll never be another plateful this side of the grave. Liddy looked at the housekeeper's face pinched with anger and then down on the top of Rachel's head. The child was trembling like Oliver, she thought. Like Oliver. For more, that boy will be hung. I know that boy will be hung. Oh, Rachie, Rachie, I don't want to think of you a hungry. I'll pay you more, she promised Mrs. Bedlow. It isn't the money, but it was quite clear to Liddy that it was indeed the money in addition to the risk. So Liddy bowed to fetch payment from the bank the very next day. She had to buy time, at least until she heard from Charlie. She had fi finished her own supper. She fetched Rachel from the kitchen, took her out to the privy, and then led her by hand up the staircase to the bedroom. All of this was accomplished with either of them, with neither of them saying a word aloud although inside Liddy's head lengthy conversations were bouncing about. As she tucked the quilt about the child, she tried some of her practice lines aloud. What did you do today, Rachie? Did Tim make you do some score? Ain't Mrs. Bedlow funny? She's all right, eh? Just scared to break a rule. We gotta do what the corporation says, you know, cuz if we don't, we're out of a job. And then what we do, eh? There was no answer. She hadn't expected any. Still, you mustn't be worried, Rachie. Judah can't sell the farm. Charlie and me, we won't let him. We're keeping it for Papa. There was a flicker of life in the eyes. And Mama, and Charlie, and Rachie, and Liddy, too. Did she just imagine the child had relaxed a little against the pillow? Or was it a trick of the candlelight? candlelight? Maybe if she read aloud, as Betsy had to do. She opened all of her twist and commenced. When Rachel fell asleep, she didn't know. Liddy was lost in the comfort of the familiar words. When the bell rang, she blew up the candle and lay in the darkness, feeling the presence of the small body nearby. What could she do? Where could she turn for help? She couldn't keep Rachel here. And yet, she, Liddy, must live in a corporation house to keep her job. And without her job, what could she do for any of them? But how could she put this little lost child out with strangers? She cursed her aunt and uncle. What could they have been thinking of to bring the child here? And yet, wasn't she better off here with Liddy, who loved her, than with those two, who must not have given her enough to eat? Poor little Rachel. Poor old Liddy. She heaved herself over in bed. She had to sleep. There was nothing she could do until she heard from Charlie. Surely Charlie could stop Judah from selling the farm. And then, debt or no debt, she'd take Rachel home. Let them try to get her off that land again. Just let them try. In her uneasy sleep, she saw the bear again, but suddenly, in the midst of his clumsy thrashing about, he threw off the pot and was transformed, leaping like a spring buck up into the loft where they were huddled, and she could not stare him down. Okay, so that was the end. There was a lot there that you guys needed to pay attention to for chapter 15 on page 71 and your vocabulary on 72. The word stout here in this case means um, she's not stout. That means she's not healthy. She's not in this context. It usually means stout usually means fat, but not in this case. In this case, it means um, your mind is where it's supposed to be. And mama's the opposite of that. She's crazy. Okay. All right. Um, and distraught means she's very upset that um, she doesn't know what to do. She's distraught that they're going to sell the farm without her permission. So, um, there, yeah. Okay. So you can rewind this as much as you can and I'll see you later.